Typically, when we read Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42, or when we read just about anything in Scripture, um, we tend to read those words from the perspective of the second person pronoun, you. When you read Scripture and something is in there about you, you read that as about you. So Jesus says, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And so now you're in a particular frame of mind, aren't you? We read this from the perspective of those who are being sent. That makes total sense. As we've seen over the past several weeks, there are many passages in the Gospels that are sending passages, moments when Jesus sends disciples out to do specific work, do certain kinds of ministry. And the context of Matthew 10 is certainly one of those passages because the context is one that addresses the disciples who are being sent. It's written to them. They're the, they are the you in this chapter. And we read this from their perspective. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. I'm sending you, whoever welcomes you. And so you read this and you settle into your comfy position of you're being sent. You should. That's the right way to do it. But it's long been said by many people before me that scripture is like a multifaceted jewel. And you have to turn it over and over in your hands to see it from all the different angles. And as you do, the light shines through it just differently and you catch different colors in the jewel that you didn't see before you turned it. We have to turn this over in our hand time and time again. And we find there's more than one way to read these verses. There is. There's also within these words an invitation to receive those who are sent. Just as much as there's instruction for those who are sent, this isn't written only for those who are being sent. This is written for those who are receiving those who have been sent. I don't usually look at the jewel that way. Um, it's not usually written that way, so I don't look at it that way, but that's probably a good reminder. I'd like us to focus this morning on the significance of cultivating that perspective of having a receptive heart to God's messengers. We, we know what it is to be sent. We know what it is to be a messenger. But I think most of us might have already checked out and said we don't receive messages anymore because we got it a long time ago. Maybe. Maybe we could still hear a word. If we could just cultivate some sort of receptive heart and a discerning spirit in this relationship with God. It's a dangerous thing to assume you've already had all the messages from God you're ever going to get. It's a dangerous thing to think God isn't talking to you anymore. He's just sending you to do the talking. Um, typically, people who do all the talking need to be doing just as much listening. That tends to be the case. This passage, it invites us to reflect on the diverse ways that God's word comes to us and to the importance of being open-hearted and discerning in our reception of his message. So as you delve into this text, as you turn the jewel over in your hand a few times, we can discover how God speaks to us through various messengers and how we can actively participate in his transformative work if we are willing to receive those who are sent and the message that has been given. Because Matthew 10, it, it expands our understanding of how God's word reaches us, doesn't it? Um, if I was to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have heard the big booming voice of God in your head or outside of your head in your own privacy of your home, even if you had, you wouldn't raise your hand. I, I know that's true. I've tried this before. It's none of you would raise your hand. And if you did, uh, somebody else would probably be making mental note of this person might be a little crazy. I don't know how that voice sounds to you, if it's James Earl Jones or if it's uh, who. If, if, maybe Charlton Heston. I know he never was the voice of God, but there's a connection there. I don't know what voice you're hearing, but if you're hearing voices, you tend to think you're crazy. But God has spoken to people throughout time in various ways, and it's not always a big booming voice. Jesus teaches that those who welcome his messengers also welcome him and the one who sent him. This passage, it emphasizes that God's word can come to us through various channels. Messengers doesn't just mean people. It doesn't mean just big, booming voices. Sometimes it's the voices of others. Someone you've known your whole life or a complete stranger. Sometimes it's scripture. Sometimes it's through prayer. And the Psalms, the Proverbs, they remind us that nature itself speaks on behalf of God. 
countless other means. God uses all sorts of ways to try to communicate with us, not just in those days back then, not just in big booming voices from mountains, and everything in between. But if we are a people who think we are only messengers and that we don't receive messengers, we're not usually paying attention and looking out for those. And they just go right by us unnoticed. As we journey through life, we encounter different messengers and avenues through which God communicates truth. Sometimes his word may be spoken directly to us, though you don't have to share that with anyone else. And other times it might be whispered through a still, small voice within your own heart. But by expanding our perspective, by turning the jewel over, we open ourselves to the diverse ways in which God is trying to reach out to us. But if we don't have the ears to hear or the eyes to see, we might just miss it. Which is why Jesus is reminding us here in Matthew 10 to be a receptive people, not just a sent people, but a receptive people. And receptivity requires discernment, doesn't it? Not everything is a message from God. Um, The Blues Brothers proved that to us. Not everything is, is supposed to be God's big booming voice in your life. Not every stop sign you pass on the road is God telling you to stop whatever it is that you need to be stopping. It doesn't work that way. Not everything is direct communication from God. But some things are. They really are. Discernment is the ability to live between those two extremes, between assuming that God has nothing to say and that God is trying to say everything, like as if every time you open up a bag of Cheetos and you see one that's Jesus-shaped, that's a message from God. You don't need to sell your burnt toast on eBay and call it a message from God. Not everything is from God, but, but some things are. Not all the Cheetos, not all the toasts, not all the signs, some of them. Discernment helps us figure out which is which. Both of those extremes are unhealthy. To say that God has nothing to say is as bad as saying that God says everything. Discernment is how we tune ourselves properly to what God is speaking into our lives to kind of sort it all out. A good example of this is Jeremiah. No, nothing in particular, just Jeremiah in general, his entire career from beginning to end. During his time, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet of God. I don't know if Jeremiah really understood what that meant. I don't know if we really understand what that means. In its basic form, prophet just means mouthpiece. That's, that's all it means. It's a mouthpiece. You're one who speaks on behalf of God. That's it. Jeremiah was given the task of giving messages to the people of Israel on behalf of God. Um, He didn't usually know what the messages meant. He didn't usually know what their significance was. He just got a message, gave a message. Um, God tells him to cut his hair and act a little crazy. He cuts his hair and acts a little crazy. He just follows directions. Not a bad gig if you're good at following directions. That's what Jeremiah does. God was trying to communicate with the people directly through his messenger, Jeremiah. Got it. Problem is, Jeremiah's voice was not the only voice that was out there saying they were communicating on behalf of God. There were a lot of other prophets in Jeremiah's time who weren't as crazy and who had more experience and were older and had the right kind of outfits for that. And you see, Jeremiah was just a teenage kid. He didn't know what in the world he was doing. Jeremiah was so bad at being a prophet, he had his own scribe who was, he had his own editor, his own filter that followed him around and said, not like that, try it this way. (laughs) Jeremiah was awful, and there were professional prophets at the time of Jeremiah, and he wasn't. He was just a kid playing basketball on the court. He wasn't trying to get paid professionally to do this. He was just, he was just a guy. There were a lot of other prophets at the time that were not commissioned by God. They were commissioned by the king. And the king said, I want the people to do this. And the prophets packaged that up and said, we'll tell them God said it. And so the prophets were on the king's payroll. That's their professional prophets. And they, their job was to take what the king said, package it as God's words, and give it to the people. And say, God said this. Uh, there's a word for that. We tend to call them false prophets. Um, they probably call themselves something else. They don't usually think of themselves as false prophets. They just conflated the king's authority with God's authority. They put the two together. Dangerous thing to do that. These false prophets looked kind of like Jeremiah, but better. They sounded like Jeremiah, but better. And they claimed all the same authority as Jeremiah, 
but their messages and their authority came from people, not God. So in Jeremiah 28, 5 through 9, we witness that struggle that he faces on a daily basis as like the real voice that's getting drowned out by all the fake. That's nothing that you have any experience with, real things being drowned out by fake. That's completely irrelevant in 2023. So Jeremiah 28, 5 through 9, he says, uh, it says this, then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah. Hananiah is a good guy, actual prophet, not one of the other ones. In the presence of the priests, king's payroll, and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord, uh, and the prophet Jeremiah said, truly, may the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied. That's a, that's a direct jab at everybody else who's prophesied everything else. And bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. See, here comes, here comes prophet message, right? The prophets who preceded you and me, the ones from ancient times, they prophesied war and famine and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, well, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it'll be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. He had no tact, that Jeremiah. And he faced opposition, he faced ridicule, even persecution for delivering a message that challenges the status quo. Despite the difficulties, Jeremiah just could not suppress the word that burned within him, the, the real true message of God. His experience in this conflict between real and fake, it, it demonstrates the power of God's word. It demonstrates the need for receptive hearts to embrace its transformative message. But it also reminds us of the need to be a discerning people as well. Some prophets declare war and famine on your enemies, the things that you love to get behind, the stuff that makes really good political platforms. Um, and, but the true prophet might say something you don't like, and that's how you know it's probably true. Um, nobody liked Jeremiah. <laughs> he, he did not have a career as a professional prophet, but he did it the right way, the honest way. Jeremiah had to say the truth, but he needed a discerning people to be able to tell what was true. It took both it's why you can't read just Matthew from the perspective of the one who's being sent. You have to have somebody who's being sent to. You have to have both. You have to have a true message and you have to have a receptive people. Sometimes you're being sent, but sometimes you need to remember to be receptive. We all do. Jeremiah's story reminds us that God's word may come to us through unexpected messengers, especially in the face of opposition. It can require courage and a deep commitment to listen and respond faithfully, regardless of the circumstances. And if we can cultivate receptive hearts, then we can position ourselves to receive and embody God's truth, especially when it challenges us to step outside of our comfort. And so opening ourselves to God's word, cultivating receptive hearts, it involves creating an environment within ourselves and around us that welcomes God's word in all of its forms. It begins with an openness and a willingness to listen, to set aside our preconceived notions, to be attentive to the diverse messengers that God places in our lives. Receptive hearts are humble, they're teachable. They seek to receive God's truth with humility and gratitude. And to cultivate those receptive hearts, we have to act, actively engage with Scripture. You can't do it on your own. You have to allow Scripture to speak to you, to transform your life. We need to be intentional in creating space for prayer, reflection, contemplation, all of those active listening skills that everybody always talks about. That's where we can hear God's voice. That's where we discern His guidance. And we should embrace the wisdom and the insights shared by fellow believers, recognizing that God can use others to impact your life, to impart his truth and deepen your understanding. And recognizing God's truth, 
while, while being receptive is crucial, you also at the same time, in conjunction with receptivity, have to develop a discerning spirit to distinguish God's truth from falsehood. Discernment involves aligning what we hear and what we experience with the unchanging truth of God's word. It requires seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who grants wisdom and reveals God's truth to us. Discernment calls us to critically examine teachings, experiences, influences in light of Scripture. It helps us to navigate the complexities of the world and make choices that align with God's will. So through prayer, through study, through reflection, we sharpen our ability to recognize God's voice amidst the clamor of competing voices so that we can make sure that we don't stray from truth. As we cultivate these receptive hearts, these discerning spirits, we actively participate in God's transformative work in our lives. We become vessels through which his word flows. We are sent to give a message. It impacts not only ourselves, but those around us. And when we embrace God's word with, with receptivity, with discernment, we are empowered to embody his truth and reflect his love and grace to the rest of the world. We are receiving that so that we can give that. Take what you are given and give it to others. And like Jeremiah, we face challenges and opposition as we live out God's word. But through receptive hearts, with discerning spirits, we stand firm in our faith and trust in God's guiding presence. And we become agents of truth, bringing hope, healing, transformation to a world that needs it, but doesn't always hear it or receive it. Therefore, let us embrace this call to cultivate receptive hearts, to be people who receive God's message. With a discerning spirit, may we be open ourselves to the diverse ways in which God can give his word to us. May we listen actively, attentively to his messengers of all forms, whatever comes your way. And let us be humble and teachable, seeking to receive and embody God's truth in every aspect of our lives. As you engage with scripture, with prayer, with reflection, may you discern God's voice amidst the noise of the world. And may your discerning spirit guide you in navigating the complexities of life and making choices that align with God's will. And through your receptive heart and discerning spirit, may you actively participate in God's work, becoming agents of his truth and vessels of his love and grace. May you receive God's word just as much as you are think you're sent to tell it to somebody else. And that's a lot of words to say what Jesus said much better than me. Sometimes you might think you have something to say to somebody else, but you might need to clean out your ears first. Um, or if you want to put it in some older fashion terms, sometimes you think your brother has a, a speck in his own eye, but you might have a log in yours. Or as my grandparents would say, sometimes the best way to say something is to listen first. Right? It's what we do at this table that we're coming to. This table isn't just something you eat. It's not just something you drink. It's not just an appetizer before lunch. This table is a form of receptivity and discernment. It's a time for you to listen before you speak. It's a time for you to hear the message God has for your life before you try to push it on someone else. It's a time to come to the table with receptivity, with discernment, with an open heart, with ears that hear and eyes that see and find at this table the message of God so that you can take the right message back out into the world. And before you can take a message, you have to receive it. Come to this table this morning, receive the love and grace of God, his message for the world. And as you leave this place, take it with you wherever you might go. Let's stand and sing.